not all condensing coils are going to be air cooled. Some of these are going to be what we call water cooled. So this is a condensing coil. I believe this is a three ton system. So it's a pretty good size system, but we can transfer a ton of heat here. If you think about how light air is, it takes a lot of air for us to transfer heat. But if we're using water or a glycol mixture, it's a lot heavier and it will hold more BTUs. So I can put a whole lot more BTUs into water faster than I can put BTUs into air. So this is a water cooled heat exchanger. In this heat exchanger, there's still three things happening. We're going to de-superheat the refrigerant. We're gonna change it from a vapor to a liquid, condensing, that's gonna be latent heat. And then at the very end, we're going to end up subcooling this below saturation, the subcool liquid. So this is doing all three things. Let's take a closer look at how it works. Do you have a water-cooled condenser? This is for a refrigeration system, but it can also be for residential systems, it can be for geothermal systems, it can be for high-rise buildings that have cooling towers in the roof, many applications. All we're doing is taking the heat from the refrigerant and putting it into water. So we're gonna have water pipes. We're gonna have a water pipe here and also the water pipe on the other side. So there's gonna be water flowing through this coil. We're also gonna have refrigerant pipes. So here our refrigerant's coming in this side and our refrigerant is flowing out on this side. So it's gonna be coming, the refrigerant's gonna be coming in as a high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor. It's gonna de-superheat, change from a vapor to a liquid, condense, and then it's gonna subcool that refrigerant. And the subcooled liquid refrigerant's gonna come out of this tube here on the bottom on the side. So there's gonna be water and refrigerant. Now, most of the time, the refrigerant and the water's going in a counter flow location. So let's say the refrigerant's coming in this direction on this side of the pipe, the water will be coming in on the opposite direction. So the refrigerant's coming in, the water's coming out, the water's coming in here, and the refrigerant's coming out there. The idea behind this is the coolest water is touching already the coolest refrigerant. So there's gonna be a temperature difference between the water and the refrigerant, so we can have good heat transfer. Here, even though the water's heated up, the refrigerant coming in, this is its hottest part. So, so here, as the counter flow comes out, the water's coming out, and even though the water's coming out at its warmest point here, the refrigerant's coming in at its warmest point also. So the refrigerant is still gonna be warmer than the warm water. There's gonna be second law of thermodynamics, heat transfer. Heat's gonna leave the refrigerant and go to the cooler water. So, and they're not always that way, but typically it's how they are. So that's how we're doing removing refrigerant and removing water. Now, both of these are flowing to this coil, but they're not touching each other. This is nothing more than a heat exchanger, just like the air-cooled condenser is a heat exchanger. So let's take a look inside and see what we have. Here we can see what our heat exchanger looks like, and I've cut out this little section. Now, I didn't do a great job cutting it out, but I cut this out many years ago. So on the outside section, this is where our refrigerant's flowing. You can see our refrigerant pipe here, and our refrigerant's flowing through this tube one way or another. When refrigerant gets to this point here, notice how this is twisted. So it allows the refrigerant to go in a circular pack pattern. So if you think about this, if you were to straighten this out, there'd be way more coil than what you see right here. So it has really good thermodynamic properties. There's a lot of refrigerant touching a lot of the metal right here. So it's really great for heat transfer. So as the refrigerant is going through, there's more surface area and there's a lot of refrigerant touching a lot of metal. So it's great for transferring heat. Now the outside shell right here, you can see it's rusted up, but in a refrigeration system, there would never be moisture inside, or there should never be moisture inside the refrigeration system. So even though this metal here is just raw bare metal, it's okay because there should never be any moisture in there. So the refrigerant and the refrigerant oil isn't gonna rust the metal, at least not from the inside. Now this center piece of pipe, this piece here is where the water or glycol is gonna be flowing. It's gonna be flowing inside this pipe. Now this pipe can be copper or it's usually a cooper nickel, a copper nickel type mixture that prevents corrosion. So the water's flowing usually in the opposite direction of the refrigerant. So say the refrigerant's flowing this way, the water's flowing this way. And these grooves that are in here also causes the water to spin or rifle through there. That makes more heat transfer. So a lot of the water's touching a lot of this metal. So it has really good thermodynamic properties. The copper itself or the cooper nickel is also really great at transferring heat also because of the metal type. So this is what it looks like inside of one of these. And it's just all twisted up and rolled up together. Here we can look at the other end. You can see the refrigerant is going to be flowing through this section. The water or glycol is flowing through this section. And here you can see those same bins. 
So pretty basic little uh, design, but it works great. We can transfer a whole lot of heat in a very small area. Now, once the heat's into the water or the glycol, we have to do, dispose that heat somewhere else. Sometimes there's another refrigeration system that takes multiple units and transfers heat to the air, or sometimes there's a cooling tower to where we run water through, and then we transfer the heat through evaporation on the cooling tower. Um, and also there's geothermal, where we can put the heat into the water. We can run that water through a yard or even water wells or a pond or any other thing you can think of, and we can transfer heat from the water back into the earth or into the pond or any other possibility. Some um, boats and marine use also use this, but the seawater is really hard on these metals. So they usually have a separate setup for that. And I've done very little marine work, so I'm just gonna stay away from that for the most part. But if you're thinking about heat transfer, taking heat out of refrigerant and putting it into water, or you can put it into air, or you can put it into straight earth, I've seen before uh, some geothermals, it's DX, where the refrigerant piping right here is uh, actually straight into the earth itself. So we can transfer heat straight from the refrigerant into the earth. I'm not a big fan of that method. It's a lot of refrigerant piping. It's hard to find those leaks, but it's done that way. Or you can also transfer heat from the refrigerant into this water or glycol system. And glycol is nothing more than, uh, it's like an, a food safe antifreeze, so to speak, or earth safe antifreeze. So then we could take the water and run the water through the earth. Tons and tons of possibility. If you're thinking about heat transfer, then we win. That's what I want. I want you to think about heat transfer. I can't give you every single possible scenario, but if you're thinking about heat transfer, then that's what we're, we're on the win. We think about it. And hopefully you guys are going to grow to the point where I can't answer your questions and you're moving on to be engineers or designing new equipment and you're moving on and I can be learning from you. That would be the ideal world. But I'm just giving you guys the information and you can do with it as you wish.